The International Association for Near-Death Studies presents NDE Radio, a weekly exploration of near-death experiences and similar encounters with the other side. Now, here's your host, Lee Whitting. Welcome to NDE Radio with Lee Whitting. Whether you're listening on TalkZone, my podcast, through the archives of our ad-free shows on our YouTube channel, or connected through the incredible content of our Facebook page. Our guest today, Pauline Glamachak, is the daughter of an immigrant family that moved from Yugoslavia in those days, now Croatia, it was a communist country, and they left when she was free to move to the freedom of Adelaide, Australia. She experienced a number of OBEs during her childhood, the most profound when she had a head injury at age 11, and had a profound near-death experience at that time, culminating in a loving meeting with Jesus. He explained the oneness to me, Pauline has said, that everyone was equal in his eyes. Today, Pauline is a counselor and artist living in Adelaide, Australia. Pauline, welcome to NDE Radio. Thank you so much for inviting me, Lee. It's it's an honor to be with you tonight. It's an honor to have you, and yours is such an interesting experience. And our conversation just now, I was saying uh, three years uh, before, I guess, you moved to uh, Australia from Yugoslavia. My wife and three-year-old son and I traveled by a Volkswagen camper down the coast of Croatia, now then Yugoslavia. And what a beautiful country, what beautiful people they they are. Have you had a chance to get back there by any chance to visit? I was, yes, I was, uh, the last time I was there was 2017. Ah. Uh, yes. Yeah, so, um, and I actually experienced a, a winter. I didn't, I wasn't just there for tourist season. And uh, I really got it. I got why my parents chose Australia. <laughs> because <laughs> <I> just, <laughs> the winter was just biting. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I would love to visit Australia sometime. Uh, I've, I've, thought about it a long time. Ever since I was in college, I, I thought about Australia and perhaps moving there at some point in time. But oh, yeah. perhaps at this point, it's it's too late in my life. Pauline, you, you experienced a, a brief out-of-body uh, experience when you were only 18 months old. And, um, and then you were reminded of it when your mom was telling you about an OBE she experienced giving birth. Tell us about that. Yeah. Yeah, my mother told me when I was, uh, I think, you know, a teenager or something about an OB that she had. She delivered my brother, who was the third child. And um, she's got, she had some kind of condition where the children would get progressively bigger. I don't know what the, na- the term is for it, but it's some kind of uh, um, biological condition. Um, and uh, my brother was 10 pounds, and so the labor was very, very difficult. Yes, Yes. 10 pounds, and um, so it was an emergency C-section, and she experienced uh, seeing her body, um, you know, from from the ceiling looking down, and uh, she just explained how wonderful that felt, and... um, Yeah, and I, you know, told her about remembering just briefly um, my OBE. I uh, I was a toddler and I, I remember, and people sort of say, well, you shouldn't remember this, but I do. I touched my father's cigarette and developed, a, that developed into a blister and it became infected. Um, it was winter time then as well, and um, it uh, turned into bacterial pneumonia, um, which is, you know, a very distressing um, condition to have as a toddler especially. Um, and I had an out-of-body experience and saw, um, I don't know whether they injected me with adrenaline or something, but uh, I saw the going, the panic and the goings on, mm. you know, over. I was in a steel crib at the time, um, you know, the the steel sort of hospital cribs. 
Um, and uh, yes, yeah, so that was that was the first of my mm. out of body <laughs> adventures. <laughs> and, and I think you said that you felt a freedom even at eighteen months old. You felt uh, oh. d- during the OBE. Yes, yeah, and that was actually when my mother mentioned that triggered my memory, that feeling of freedom that was just um, joy, you know, mm. from being, you know, having my chest, this oppressiveness and, and inability to breathe um, to this freedom, this, uh, yeah, I, I can just describe it as freedom. And I had it again during my 11-year-old mm. uh, NDE, that free, that feeling of, being the essence of yourself, you know. Yes. With no overlays. Uh, and then in uh, 1973, I think, you, you were on a second grade class excursion and you nearly drowned. That, uh, that was an even more profound experience. What was that? Tell us about that. Yeah. Well, it was before insurance ruled the world. <laughs> before the days. <laughs> Exactly. Before we believed in insurance so much, and we, uh, I lived in the western suburbs of Adelaide, and uh, the western suburbs are quite close to uh, they've a beach, a centre beach there, and this particular beach it really is not known for rips. I mean, this is this was an anom- anomaly for sure. Um, that I don't know how sandbanks and and rips and all of that work, but. Um, I was taken out to sea. We were there for a school excursion. Uh, I was with my girlfriend, Clarissa Orlik, and uh, we'd got out. She was Russian and I was Croatian and uh, we were just learning English, you know, so we we did remedial English together and um, we became great friends. And, um, yeah, we were both out sort of, you know, um, I think waist high or so, in the water when we were taken. I didn't see what happened to her. I just felt myself go under and in a washing machine for what seemed like forever. And uh, I was taken out far um, and started to the floor, the ocean floor, and I knew I had no breath in me anymore. Um and I just felt this presence behind me. It was like I was embraced by this voice, this uh, presence. And he just said to me, and I, it was the familiarity. And I just felt I knew him. And uh, his voice permeated into me like, and said, open your eyes. And I could speak telepathically. Um, with the voice and I said I can't open my eyes because when I was taken out with the rip I tried to open my eyes and you know get some bearings and you know struggled sort of to make um, heads or tails of the situation but um, he said open your eyes again to me and when I did everything was calm and clear and the light was coming through the ocean, just like you see in, you know, those <laughs> well-lit <laughs> films, you know. It was just this yeah. beam of light coming through the the top of the um so and and that seemed quite a way up for me. And he just buoyed me. I was I was buoyed up, like pushed up. And uh before I'd gone, we'd, you know. We'd been set free on this excursion. <laughs> and the teachers explained to us what to do in the case of any emergency, getting into trouble and, you know, to, to put your arm up and, and wave for help and someone would come. So I did exactly that. And um, a teacher swam out and I was completely calm. I just felt completely calm. I didn't wrestle or you know when people are drowning they're often desperate and but I was just in a very calm state and when I came onto the shore I just coughed up a lot of seawater 
mm. a lot of seawater. Um, yeah, and I was just being a, a a migrant child. I was just mortified and didn't want, you know, I had a lot of unwanted attention and felt really silly for um, that having happened to me. So I didn't tell anybody about that. Uh, Did you uh, think though? Wow, there there really is a God. I mean, does did that thought cross your? You were only six or seven, right? Yeah, yeah. I, I thought it was an angel, or I didn't know what to think of it. I didn't uh. think of it too much. I knew it was real, but I just mm. I don't know why I didn't allow myself to think of it too much. Yeah. And you know. Even at, during my eleven-year-old experience, I st- didn't allow myself to. Um, it, yeah. Well, you, I guess you have explained in the, that um, being raised in a socialist country, your you, well, your family especially couldn't practice religion, although they did when they came to Australia. That they uh, were cat- attended Catholic church, but they weren't. Uh, intensely religious i guess or at least you weren't um so uh and then i think you said uh, in a previous interview you were age 11 uh this is in 1977 it was Mm -hmm. a a beautiful autumn day and your family went on a picnic Uh, there was a massive crucifix on a hill that you happened to see Mm -hmm. there yeah, yeah. Um, I just have to go back to to correct you about something because my my parents were I would call them methodically religious. Ah, <laughs> you know? Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Not Methodists, methodically <laughs> religious. Okay. Uh, <laughs> you know, so that we did attend church. I took my sacraments. We, you know, they did all of that, but we weren't Bible readers. We we weren't. Um, it was just a different kind of religious education. Uh, it was, yeah, it was not kind of, you You didn't think that it would really happen to you. It was. Well, that's, I was raised Catholic too. And Catholics are not Bible readers, unfortunately. Yeah. And the church does not like to encourage personal mystical experience, such as a near death experience, because it often argues with their authority, you know, what you learn on the other side. And so uh, they don't encourage it. Now, many of their saints, I mean, highly revered saints had exactly the kind of mystical experience that near death experiences represent. So, so it is a bit of a contradiction in their own uh, philosophy, but. Precisely. Anyway, was it a mountain that you were, uh, or a park that you'd gone to? What's oh, it? yeah. Sorry. Sorry, I digressed. Um, yeah. <laughs> so that was in 1977. This was uh-huh. the this was the main event. This was yes. my encounter with Jesus. Um, in 1977, we had friends in Melbourne and um, we were invited to go visit with them. They were family friends of my father's. So um, he hadn't seen them since we'd migrated to Australia. And so we packed up the station wagon and um, hit the road. Eight hours later, we were in Melbourne and um, we went with these friends on a picnic um, to the Mount Macedon Ranges. Now, this is a a really, um, it's recognised as a very spiritual place in Australia, I didn't know anything about that at the time. I was 11 years old. Mm -hmm. Um, 1977, the 70s weren't really renowned for spirituality, you know. (laughs) (laughs) Um, It was cowboy's wheel, I I call it. (laughs) Everything was like a Western. Um, But, yeah, uh, so we were with this family, two older boys, my sister and brother and I, and as soon as we arrived at this uh, picnic site in the Macedon Ranges, and yes, you mentioned the crucifix, um, before we jumped out of, you know, and settled down to to a picnic, um, we went on top of this hill and there was a massive crucifix um, 
there a, a war memorial. And later I found out that it's very a significant, a spiritually significant place to the Australian Aboriginals of the area mm. and recognised as such by, you know, <laughs> with a memorial as well, with a, a, a crucifix. So I didn't think much of it. The view was magnificent from the crucifix, but I, we didn't, you know, um, we didn't think that much of it as children. And anyway, so we we just looked forward to running amok away from the parents, <laughs> getting out of the car and, you know, having our own fun, fun making our own adventures. And um, so we were running down this hill. The two older boys were in front and, you know, my brother and sister were in front of me and I was last and, you know, I was <laughs> trying to save face. I picked up some some um, some speed and just the impetus took me over and I knew that I was going to fall head first and keep tumbling. And these were older boys and I was just on the cusp of puberty, just beginning to notice boys. So, um, you know, I didn't want to embarrass myself <laughs> and... <laughs> <laughs> so instead of going with the impetus and trying to, re I threw myself back as hard as I could to stop myself. And as it happened, I struck my right temple on a rock. Mm. And uh, upon doing that, when I threw myself back, I thought I was, I expected to feel the thud and I didn't feel anything. I just, I felt like I'd opened my eyes, but I was still in darkness. And as soon as I wondered, well, this is strange, how come I'm not feeling anything? Um, then it happened. You know, I experienced myself leaving my body, leaving, yeah, just very quickly in, 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 at speed, leaving my body. And I glanced back, but not with any kind of connection or, um, you know, just a brief curiosity uh, because, again, I was just enthralled by this sense of freedom, uh, this sense of un unencumbered. I just felt so unencumbered. I didn't have anxiety. I just felt joy, pure joy, bliss, joy. Um, yeah. I don't know how many words. I could find to describe it, but it was just bliss, bliss. Yeah. Uh, and I also felt I wasn't going anywhere. I was just felt uh, under my own, it wasn't of my own volition. It wasn't that I was propelling myself. I was being drawn. And I felt very safe in being drawn, so much so that I could look around and enjoy the view and just kept looking in amazement, but it was so fast that soon enough I was uh, in a whiteout in the clouds, in the clouds. And at that stage, I felt cold. Um, I felt coldness and I don't know if I felt fear, but I felt trepidation. I think that is the precise word for it. Um, after that feeling of coldness, I felt trepidation and I looked up and the atmosphere there are so many things that confirm my NDE to me now. You know, the atmosphere being as thin as it is. That was something I didn't know as an 11-year-old. You know, we, uh, we, we hadn't, you know, that no studies in atmospheric uh, volume or uh, um, anything like that. Yeah. Um, so it was very quickly that I was in space. It wasn't that long that I was in space. And as soon as I realized that I'm in space and how, how long am I going to be floating in space, um, as soon as there was that trepidation, this black hole appeared. And that's the best description I have for it, a black hole. Um, but it was a portal because it drew me through it and um, I just felt great speed Things were grey and 
you know, like, like things are blurred in, at great speed. So there was this that grayness. And then um, when I felt fear about that and looked up, I saw a light, uh, the proverbial, and um, found myself coming into the light. And as soon as I was into the light, it was just such love, knowledge, acceptance. It was uh, familiarity. Familiarity was just, oh, that's right. I've been here before. That's right. Everything was like a recollection and um, every answer came to me and it was so simple and it was something like love is the creator. You know, love holds everything together, everything together. And it was... uh, it was it was this answer that was so simple. I was a child and I could understand it, but it was so, um, oh, of course, you know. I don't know what I'd, I'd give everything to be able to remember what that answer was now. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I can't remember every, you know, I can't remember. Yeah. There, are, there are parts that aren't given to me to remember. Yes. Yeah. So um, that was just amazing. And uh, so I realized that I was in this different atmosphere. It was like, it was like those, like bubbles of light, tangible light bubbles. And it was, everything had a golden tinge. Mm. And it was as though I was floating up in this atmosphere. And then I looked down as I looked around, it was, this light was communicating with me. And as I looked around, I I saw this group of people. And as as soon as I saw them, I was with them. Um, And they were just faces and they were looking at me so expectantly. And uh, they knew me. They were ancestors, but I didn't know. I can't tell you who they were because at that point only my grandfather died. Mm. And uh, I was three years old when he died. But um, I'm sure he was one of them. <laughs> but I was, uh, it seemed that I was, it was this huge welcome and it was like this huge celebration about me being, being with them. And uh, as though I was some kind of significant person and I, I'd never felt so significant. It was so strange to me, you know, their reception, uh, so warm. And uh, loving and, but yeah, I was with them. It seemed that I was with them only briefly. I can't remember that much of that encounter, but as I took them in and I looked around at where I was, I could see this wall. I could see like a, it was a gate, but it was a, an arched gate and um, this this wall, and but I could see beyond the wall, and I could see these hills, and I was looking. I just thought, what a beautiful world I've come into. Mm. If I could disc- in in contemporary language, I'd sort of say it was something like a cross between a classical Roman, just an ancient kind of world, with a Star Trek twist. <laughs> it sounds funny, but. It, it was sort of, I guess, because everything was so plasma light. Everything was a living light. It wasn't material like this, this world is. So, yeah, I was, as I was taking that in, I saw this golden light and, and I thought That's, that must be the sun. But I noticed it was growing larger and I realised it was an orb and uh, it was very mercurial and, and like mercurial plasma. And um, as I looked at the colours of it, it was it was like a flame as well, but the centre was white. And as I noticed that the centre was white, I noticed that there was a, a silhouette in the centre of, of this orb. As I noticed that it was as soon as I noticed that it was a silhouette, it was as though it was close to me. Uh, I don't know, six feet away or something. It wasn't immediately close to me, you know, and a figure stepped out and as the figure stepped out towards me, I knew immediately 
who it was. And um, when he was in the orb, his arms were outstretched, but not like the crucifixion, but like a hug, like someone waiting to hug me. (laughs) When I saw him, he immediately imbued me with communication. He immediately let me know, oh, you've come too soon. It was like this uh, chuckling, you've come too soon. And as soon as he felt that I thought to myself, is that Jesus, he's really real. You know, I said that inside of myself and he laughed. (laughs) He chuckled so hard. (laughs) He thought I was so funny. But, yeah, at once he, he let me know that he thought I was funny for saying He's is he? He's really real. <laughs> <laughs> um, and also, at, at once he communicated to me that I'd come through too early. You know, oh, you naughty! It was. It wasn't. He didn't speak the words. You, you naughty girl, or you naughty child. You've come. You've come back too soon. But that was the feeling that he gave me that I'd come through too soon. And um, when. You know, he chuckled into me. He just imbued me with himself. And that was so overwhelming. That was just so, um, so overwhelming that I immediately, I immediately fell to his feet. And uh, I had never, I hadn't read in the Bible as I have now that every knee shall bow. I didn't know that that was written in the Bible (laughs) until recently, actually. Um, So I just fell to his feet and I cried like I'm crying now, (laughs) but more. (laughs) I should have brought some tissues here. (laughs) Here we are. A counsellor without tissues at hand. (laughs) (laughs) I have some here, but I don't think I can pass them through the Zoom to Australia. I've got them. (laughs) (laughs) So, um, yeah, so that was just the energy that he imbued me with was so big. It said so much. There was so much in it that I could go on and on about everything that he communicated to me, Mm. about who I was to him and how much he loved me. And uh, what he thought of me, and um, immediately, yeah, as I said, I thought his feet. And when I collected myself and I communicated things to him, I must have, um, I think that I, you know, told him that I was sorry for some things and sorry for not believing in him, mainly. <laughs> And um, when I did that uh, and calmed down, he, I could see his, I was at his feet, his feet glowed. They were like alabaster. He was just all aglow. And uh, as I looked at his feet and I realised he was in, you know, I saw his sandals and I thought, wow, his sandals. Like, <laughs> and they were, they were, <laughs> um, They were leather sandals, but they were, you know, strung through the toe. And I always, you know, when I'd seen, you know, pictures of Jesus in the children's Bible or for Sunday school, I never saw him, saw those kind of sandals, you know. So that was like something that was, oh, oh, (laughs) we call it, uh, you call them flip-flops in the Uh States, but we call them thongs here in Australia. Um, And, uh, yeah, so I found that amusing. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, and he didn't rebuke me for finding that amusing, although he knew everything that I was, he could read my mind about everything. But, yeah, so I found that amusing. But the next thing I saw higher up on his foot was this hole and gold, a gold light, gold light shone through this hole, which was probably the same light of the orb that he came in. But, um, yeah, uh, and as I looked into this gold light, well, first of all, I realised immediately 
that it was, the crucifixion was real. Before then, I didn't even know whether I believed that the crucifixion was real. So now I realize that that was real. And as soon as I realized that and I looked into that light, it was like I was just given images of the crucifixion. I was given images of his flesh hanging from his bones and Mm. images of, yeah, his flesh hanging and blood, his blood dripping on the flagstone and uh, water, water as well. Um, So he was unrecognisable. That's what I can say about it. And it was so shocking to me. I couldn't imagine the horror. The horror, it was just like, I'm sorry, I'm finding it hard to talk about tonight, but it was just so difficult to have seen that. Uh, You know, first I saw him in glory and then I saw that. And a whole lot of emotions came up in me and I just said, does that, does it still hurt? Because it was really, it was real. You know, I I was right there. It was real. It was no longer some kind of abstract concept. So I asked him, does it still hurt? And he said, no. And as soon as he said no, it was just like this, uh, his voice, everything was like, no. And it was huge, his voice again. Mm. And the light was, grew. You know, the light just enveloped me and he took me away like now I was in a different realm it was as though the light had transported me and now I was flying over this landscape Uh, it was an arid landscape I didn't recognize it for for Israel at the time I was just enthralled with flying with him because now I just yeah I just seen this horror and now he was saying, no, it's not horrible anymore. And he he was, we were birds, you know. <laughs> we were, um, I didn't feel I had a body, but I could feel the wind. I could feel everything. Um, anyway, so we flew over. There were just pockets of oases and pockets of greenery. And then this walled city, which I now know is old Jerusalem. And um, he brought me into this courtyard. He was with me the whole time. And we were above these people. They were like, it was like a corridor almost. Um, It was almost like a corridor of people. And they were just vitriolic and screaming and yelling and so hateful. And uh, I, um, I could feel everything from them. And it was so acrid and assaulting to my senses after having been in his pure love, in the pureness of his love. The contrast was just jarring and I felt hatred and anger for them, for, for, for their hatred and anger. You know, <laughs> I felt... How dare you feel that way in front of the king, you know? (laughs) (laughs) I didn't really realise yet what was going on. So um, he he basically let me know, no, don't feel that way. And he placed me in the vicinity of this woman who was a little up on a platform, a bit higher than this mob, and... um, placed me up there next to her and she was just an ordinary looking woman, nothing different about her. She was wearing jewellery. She was, she had black hair. Her hair was covered, but a tendril of her hair had fallen out of her scarf. And I always remember this because of the contrast of her hair, the blackness of her hair and the shine of her hair to her face. Uh, She was, you know, you know, older, but her hair was very, very black. And as soon as I looked at 
as soon as I was in her vicinity, in her energy, I could feel, uh, first of all, I studied her and I didn't guess that it was his mother because she had almond-shaped brown eyes and his eyes weren't brown. Um, so not that the... Uh, not that appearances are, are important at all, but um, it, I didn't. It, I didn't know that that was his mother, Mother Mary, at all. And uh, but as soon as I could go into her, I, I perceived it was like I got a snapshot of everything about her: her working in the fields, working at a loom. Um, you know that she'd woven her own clothes. I just knew a whole lot of things, a whole lot of things about her immediately. I got a download about her and I got a download, not a download. I got um, complete insight into her heart and what she was feeling at that time. And it was just, and what he was feeling, it was like I was sandwiched between this love and she was grieving. And that, that was when I realized that it was his mother because I could feel the love he had for her. And the excruciating pain that she was in. So when I had asked him if it still hurt, he showed me what still hurt. That was his answer to me. That it hurt him, that it hurt her. And when he, when I couldn't stand any more of that empathy, <laughs> that level of empathy, and really when I look at it all, it was all about empathy. The entire experience was empathy, empathy, and empathy, you know, um, from him for others, for me, for his mother. Um, but, yeah, when I couldn't stand any more of her pain, she was trembling. She was, I don't know how she held herself together, but I guess she didn't have a choice. Um, she was in a, a mob that was really violent. Um, so. Yeah, then he he brought me back. Like suddenly I was just back with him. And now we were in space. I was in space with him, but he was even more glorious. It was like he wasn't in orb. He was just all glory, all glory shone from him, like these rays that were just to eternity. And, yeah, he shone even brighter than the first time, if, if that was even possible. But, <laughs> yeah, he, he was just glory. And uh, he then took me to sit on this big, I wasn't that conscious anymore of the ancestors or the kingdom or anything like that, you know, the world that I was standing outside of when he, for, when he came to me. I wasn't conscious of that anymore. Now I was just con conscious of being in out of space. So, uh, in in space, out of space, mm -hmm. out in space. <laughs> right. um, uh, so, I um, he, he took me to sit on this huge rock. It was this big, flat, black rock, and I remember it because my legs dangled over the edge of it into space, and I saw my legs dangling, and I looked at my knees next to his knees, and he was to my right. I was to his left, and um, we just watched this colour, this nebula forming, um, uh, not forming, it was just alive and moving and developing and it was just creating. He let me know that that was creation and that creation had something to do with colour. You know, this colour was creation and it was happening straight away and, of course, now... I know a little bit about quarks and, um, you know, photons and um, electrons and plasma and all of these things that I had no idea about then. And nebulas, I had no idea what a nebula was in 1977. <laughs> <laughs> you know, hardly anybody did. Um, so, yeah, I... Um, I sat there just, and I just wanted to be there forever with him. And he sensed that, you know, and 
he he turned around and said, look here, my child. And he put his right hand in front of us and suddenly his hand was huge. And this energy just twinkled as his hand swept across. And from that twinkling, this book appeared suddenly and it was tilted towards us. And it was a very, seemed like a large book to me, uh, you know, like large. <laughs> uh-huh. Uh-huh. Um, <laughs> um, and it was tilted towards us and there was the writing on the first page and I think it said beloved. Um, and I thought, great, he's going to be teaching me something. And, um, because it came just after that thought of, oh, I just want to be, I just want to be here with you forever. Mm-hmm. And uh, suddenly this book started just flicking and I could see this beautiful young couple uh, welcoming a child and, it was like a Hollywood production, though. It was like the, one of those pleasant musicals, you know. It was just <laughs> so uh, perfect. There was just perfection in it. Um, so much so that I didn't recognise that it was my story on earth from birth. I didn't recognise that until it came to Uh, It showed me in relationship with everybody and everybody was wonderful and beautiful and everything was wonderful and beautiful until this exchange that I had with a friend of mine. And um, I felt offended about something she said and so I offended her back and I said something really hurtful to her and I could feel her hurt. And I was mortified because then I realized that I was watching how purely Jesus sees me and my life and my life story and how I had hurt somebody and how that felt. And in the light of his love, it felt awful. I just, I just really felt awful for, for having hurt her. I was mortified. And I thought to myself, well, well, hang on a minute. How, how can this work? Because if I can't defend myself, you don't understand. I said to him, you don't <laughs> understand. <laughs> and uh, I, I started to carry on because I wanted to get myself out of this guilt that I was feeling. And um, he laughed at me when I said, you don't understand. Hmm. <laughs> and yeah. um he just, uh, he, he had so much patience for me, Lee. Um, it's, it's just hard to fathom how much patience. It <laughs> thought as though if I need whatever I needed, he would, he would give me just to get me to that decision that I, he needed me to make, <laughs> <laughs> which was to come back. But um, I knew at, at that point too, I knew automatically at once that he wanted me to, you know, to go back. And uh, Be- before we leave that, I-, I have to ask you, because at one point uh, uh, you-, you described Jesus as looking like a hippie. How, how-, how would you describe yeah, him? Absolutely. He did look like a hippie. He looked like a hippie. He was so perfect, but everything about him was movement. You know, there was nothing stiff about him. It was like his hair, everything was so alive about him and so full of joy. There was, um, although he had authority, but with me, he was so light, light hearted and, you know, um, just softly gentle. He was so gentle and just laughed so freely, so authentically, yeah, above. <laughs> above, he was just cool. He was so cool. Um, How would you that, describe his face? I remember really being besotted by his lips, and I think that was because I loved the, I loved making him smile. I loved when he smiled at me. That was uh, so. His lips were full. He had full lips. And I remember, I remember his eyes, but I feel if I share about his eyes, I think people won't believe me. (laughs) 
So, and it's, um, I know that when I think about his eyes, then immediately this happens. So, yeah. um, <laughs> so I don't like to, it's, uh, but his eyes were, they contained, they contained flecks of gold and brown, and, but they were mainly grey and blue and green. They were kind of like the earth. <laughs> <laughs> they were kind of like the earth, but just like gold. <laughs> it was just everything yeah. about him was gold, but there was color as well. It's so difficult to describe. But he was beautiful. He he did. I remember he had a strong nose, and I remember that because, although it doesn't seem that way now, I, I had a we have a strong family nose, and uh, I broke it when I was. Um, a child and so um I've had rhinoplasty since then. Um but yeah I, he had a strong nose, um a very strong proud nose and I really liked that. I was really <laughs> I was really um pleased with with his <laughs> his nose. <laughs> um I liked everything about him Lee. There was just nothing to not like. He was strong. He was strong. He was was very much a man. He had a very strong neck and shoulders. Mm. Um, yeah, he was chiselled. Um, there have actually there have been some. There is a, an artist who does who's done some um, renditions of of Jesus from the shrine of Turin, and uh, a couple of them that he's done. I've thought, yes, you know, that is. I don't know his name. I'm sorry, but I think if you Google it, you can probably find find who he is. But that was how he appeared to me. Now he gave you some teachings about oneness and about focus. Yes. Tell, tell us about that. Yes. I can't remember if this was. I think this was after the um, the exchange. The uh, after my life review he basically let me know and this really drew me to buddhism when i came back because uh when i read up on buddhism it it paralleled what he said what he what he told me that basically there's no hierarchy to him there's no hierarchy in in heaven in in him towards us just that we're all loved the same as one and the same yeah there's just no i love catholics more or <laughs> you know or hindus less there was none of that mm. he just let me know that he loved in the same way and that we were all made from love that we were made from one love um it sounds trite it sounds it's so difficult to put into words because our society makes expressions of such things trite, you know, um, kumbaya, and it's ridiculed, but it was just such a, a knowing that everyone is equal in his eyes. And at the same time, he loved me. He loved me as if I was the only person on earth, you know, in his presence or, you know, <laughs> that I was so, so loved. What about focus as a guide? Yes, he said to me when I, I started to cry and because I didn't want to be parted from him and when I I knew that he wanted me to go back and I said, you don't know, you know, life is really hard there and now that I know your love, I can't. it's not fair. I don't want to live without your love. And my life is really, really hard. And uh, I experienced it as that, as that, as an 11 year old. Mm -hmm. And he said to me, you can have the life that you want. It, it, everything is about your life is about your focus. You create your life with what you focus on. That is how you create your life. You can create your life to be beautiful, to be wonderful. And 
you know, I believed him. Of course I believed him. But when I came back, I didn't believe that, you know, in the material, in the material world, I didn't believe that. But of course, once I started studying psychology, it's absolutely right. Wherever we put our focus, that's what grows. Mm. Our focus is such a powerful, um, you know, feeder. <laughs> we we feed our focus feeds whatever you know energy is before us. We feed reality with our focus, and we create our reality with our focus. And um, yeah, it, it, yeah, that was what he told me. And of course, that when I did tell some, you know, some Christians about my NDE, that struck them, I think, very much as um, new agey and uh, something that's you know doesn't really correlate with anything in the Bible. And I've thought to myself, I'd love to speak with a theologian, a theologian and see whether it does, if there is anything in the Bible about that or, or perhaps research it myself. <laughs> well, as a counsellor, I'm sure you've seen it proven in reality, in the reality yeah. of this world. That Absolutely. What we focus on is, is what we are, basically. Now, yeah. as an additional incentive he gave you to return to this world. Yeah. He showed you a young man who smiled yeah. at you. Now, who was that? Yes. He must have figured that this one's not going to go easy. <laughs> <laughs> and he just told me about my freedom of choice and how if I, fo- whatever I focused on, I would create in my life. Uh-huh. And I focused on him and I said, I want to be with you. That is what I'm focusing on. I must have um, communicated that to him. And he said, look here, my child. That's exactly, those are exactly his exact words. Look here, my child. And before us, he just made this holograph appear. Holograph appear. Mm-hmm. And I, what is the right word? I always get those words mixed up. A holographic so, image is a sort of a termi, semi-transparent. Uh, yes image yes yeah and he this beautiful young man appeared and he was all of 18 or so and that that's you know for me as an 11 year old that was you know much older and I thought oh and it was it was like I was um, seeing a scene and he was looking but I knew he was looking at me and he was looking at me with such love that I knew, you know, this is this is what I have in my future. Mm. And I knew that I would have the love that I really longed for in my life. And I said to Jesus, oh, is this my husband? Am I going to be, is this going to be, is this my husband? Am I going to be married? And he just smiled. He didn't say anything. He didn't answer that at all. He just chuckled. And uh, then he showed me another image where I was in my, um, I was in my 50s, um, perhaps even 60s. And um, I had completely silver hair. I was dressed in a, in business attire and I was making um, some kind of speech to a large crowd. And um, this struck me as well because at the time when I met him, I still had my old nose. (laughs) I had my original, (laughs) my original Glavichak nose. (laughs) But now I was looking at this woman and she didn't have, so I didn't recognize her as myself immediately because I have, you know, different nose. And I thought, um, I thought quite highly of myself when I saw myself. Um, yeah, so um, that was really strange as well. And upon him showing me that, I said, and I thought immediately that it was in connection to him, because before that he even told me about some things in the fu- of the future of the world that um, people would come into relationship with him, which is what he desires, you know. He was showing me himself. 
And he said that people would come to worship him as they should. Mm. And that um, that the whole world would come to worship him. I don't know if it was the whole world, but the, there was a huge movement, a huge sweeping movement of being in relationship with him. And in 1977, it wasn't about relationship with Jesus. You know, it was about church it was mm. it was all very rigid and um people people said you know this is what happened back in the day it wasn't so much that people understood that just as miracles happened in the bible they're happening today just as there were prophets in the bible there are prophets today mm. and the same god that reigned over the jewish people of the bible is the same god that's ruling and, and creating miracles today. That was insight that he gave to me as well. That, and I, I found that amazing. Um, and basically that that would happen in my lifetime. And when I saw this uh, a spiritual wave of Christianity come over China, I thought, wow, it really, it really is happening. That was real confident. So I keep getting, it's like a, it's like a lotus that just keeps giving my NDE. <laughs> it just keeps opening wider and wider. And, and there are more, you know, oh, wow. And this, and this. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah. well, well, you said when uh, your son was in your, in his twenties, he smiled at you one day or looked at you in a certain way. And you yes. flashed back on that memory of the, of that holog- holograph that you saw yes. of, of him uh, <laughs> yes. so many years before. Yes, yes. Um, up until 2015, Lee, I still had compartmentalized that experience. I hadn't spoken to people about it. I hadn't shared it. Um, it was only after having a negative NDE that I realized that this 11-year-old experience was real. Mm. A part of me had split off and, and suspected because all the white coats said, oh, no, this is a traumatic brain injury and uh, she's brain injured now. And, you know, <laughs> so there was a part of me that suspected that it wasn't real. Um, there was a part of me that believed the doctors. But there was always a part of me that held, a, you know, that couldn't erase it. Yeah. I couldn't, Yeah. Uh, when you were returned to your body, you found there was a beagle licking your your right temple where you'd been hit. Yes, yes. <laughs> <When Jesus. laughs> how, I, how ironic I, is that? I, 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 no. Yes, I know. God, God's sense of humor. It's, just, <laughs> it's beautiful. <laughs> and also, I w- want to note that you didn't recognize your family for for hours, and yet you t- tried to tell them about Jesus. Immediately, that's that. They were as soon as I could form words. Yeah. Uh, first of all, I, uh, the beagle shocked me because at that point I was scared of them. <laughs> uh, <laughs> like, but he was trying to revive me. Obviously, now that I know dogs better, yes. much better, um, he was trying to revive me. Um, and yeah, as soon as I could talk, I said to them, to every all these faces that were peering down at me. Jesus is real. Jesus is real. You've got to believe me. Jesus is real. <laughs> they were my exact words. Um, you've got to believe me. You've got to believe me. Jesus is real. I've just been with Jesus. And of course, then all of the, all of the um, worldly logic came into play. Pauline, you were you you were gone for five minutes. Mm. You were gone for all of five minutes. Um, you know. You hadn't died, you know, you, in other words, you hadn't died. Um, and then, yeah. of course, the doctor told the, your family that it was brain damage. <laughs> yeah, thank you, well, doctor. Had, for, thank you. Thank yeah, you very much. Hikes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, oh, you've got a bit of brain fluid coming out of your ear oh. and you've got brain damage. So, um, yeah. Yeah. So well, that was... Uh, yeah, Listen, uh, since you mentioned it, um, we should take the last few minutes to talk about uh, your distressing near-death experience. 
Uh, with pleasure, Lee. I'm so grateful to have had it because um, I came back with such grace. I basically, I went through a very difficult time in my life and I was uh, physically assaulted. And as a result of that, I had to have emergency surgery for uh, ovarian torsion. And uh, it was a very, I was in a very serious um, way. Anyway, during this operation, to cut a long story short, I um, woke up thinking that I was, you know, re- coming out of anesthesia and that the nurses were moving me onto a, a bed from the operating table. And um, they were pulling at me to sit up. And I thought, oh, that's, I felt them pulling, you know, and I, th- I thought, that's strange. Why are you pulling at me to sit up? Um, when I sort of came came into consciousness, you know, uh, and they were very close, but again, it was this different kind of distorted um, microscopic and macroscopic view that you have in during an NDE. And uh, they were pulling at me and they were, everything sort of had a grayish, they, they had a grayish tint to them. And um, when I resisted, uh, because I thought it doesn't make sense that you're pulling me to sit up, I'm not going to. And as soon as I resisted, I didn't even think at that stage I'm having an NDE. I just thought, well, you're incompetent. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm not very good when I come out of anaesthetic. I don't know about other people, but I thought, <laughs> you know, I was <laughs> being highly irritable and I thought, what are you incompetent people doing to me now? Because I'd waited very, very long for the surgery. They had to get a team together. Mm -hmm. And it was a torturous wait. They kept pushing me from pillar to post. So um, so I just thought, oh, these were people who didn't know what they were doing. And I um, resisted them. And as soon as I resisted, this malevolence came over them. And I recognised this malevolence, that they were not behaving as nurses would. Mm. Um, they were not looking at me as a nurse would. And um, then I sort of just quickly glanced down at the foot of my bed and there was just a kerfuffle, but it was like it was muffled and they had all of my attention. And, um, yeah, it was it was very frightening and they were pulling at me to go with them and then I realised I was having an NDE and I just said, I'm not going with you. I'm waiting for Jesus Christ. Mm. And with that, I just fell back into the blackness. And I knew for sure that I had, that it was an NDE when I saw the nurses in recovery and the normal, you know, their normal complexion and the normal appearance and their normal um, disposition. So, um, and not only that, they were beautiful. Everyone was beautiful. The whole world was beautiful. And it wasn't just this survivor instinct. It was, I was seeing them with a spiritual, I was seeing their spirit, their spiritual self much more strongly or some, this, their shine. It was, it was almost as though I was seeing them as Jesus had shown me. He saw my family. So when you were being pulled by these malevolent spirits, back when you were 11 and you told Jesus you didn't want to be separated from him, yes. he said to you something like, you will not be parted from me, my love. You can reach mm-hmm. out for me whenever you need my love. And that yes. was a time when you did that and it worked. Yes. You were waiting yes. for Jesus. So yes. the power of his name is a cure. It's part of the focusing process, but it's a cure for a distressing near-death experience. I would say so. <laughs> I would, from my own personal experience, I would say so. Yeah. And not only that, I'd never even understood the power. I knew that you know we're not to use the Lord's name in vain, according to the Ten Commandments, but I hadn't understood, you know, the power of His name. Now, when I praise and worship and there are songs about the power of his name and 
there are scripture about the power of his name. I didn't know that even in 2015 when that happened to me, Mm. about the power of his name. But it is, there is so much power in his name. He returned me to life. He restored me, my sanity, because now I was, although I'd encountered malevolent beings, now I was whole. I knew that that experience that I had with him was real. I could see people for who they were as he created them. I could see that in them. Hmm. I was just in a state of grace for a whole year. Uh People so kind to me and it was just a state of grace is all that I can describe it as. Wow. Well, Pauline, we are out of time. I want to thank you so much for sharing your story and If people wanted to find out more about you or get in touch with you, what what would be the best way to do that? You can email me on pauline.glamourjack at gmail.com or you can look me up on, I have a professional Facebook page. So you can look me up on that as well and message me across that platform as well if you'd like to get in touch. Uh, Wonderful. Well, Pauline Glamachak, and I'll spell your last name because (laughs) they may need to know that. G-L-A-M-O-C-H-A-K. Yes, I put the H in, especially for my um, English brothers and sisters. (laughs) (laughs) Well, it's better than our trying to learn Croatian, that's for sure. (laughs) Thank you so much for sharing your story. If listeners would like to hear this show again or any of our more than 400 archived ad-free NDE interviews, go to TalkZone's NDE radio site and hit the Past Shows button or go to our YouTube channel, NDE Radio with Lee Whitting, where you can subscribe to and comment on the complete NDE radio library. And be sure to check out our NDE radio Facebook page. Just search NDE radio with Lee Whitting on your Facebook app. And listen again next Monday, 11 a.m. Eastern at Talk Zone for more NDE Radio. I'm your host, Lee Whitting, saying thanks for listening. <laughs>